First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Registrar's office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first-year and transferring students and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, oh four one four. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's oh four one four six five eight three three nine. Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion, or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step, is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step, the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, -A -A an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name, since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super-hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. 
Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success, but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second. Yet, to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks... bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Here an interview conducted by an interviewer Spiegel with a scientist, Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor Piet, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa in what was then Zera in the thermos. He wrote, there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high-security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered, 
My only thought was, oh shit! We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We're finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age, but I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name. But the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about sports. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. 
Sports usually take a variety of forms. Organized competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favorite team to victory, athletic games, played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found, and hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal, so that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, people often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favorite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case, surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports. Drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation, and with audiences who pay admission to watch. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.